Hi, everyone. I'm Randy Craighead. I'm so glad you're joining us today for Freedom Weekend. And, uh, and Simon has just been doing a great job. We just thank, thank God for Simon and his wife, Rebecca. And I know many of you probably watch him on the weekend when you're watching church online, but we love Pastor Simon and Rebecca. They're just amazing people. But anyway, I'm going to talk to you about the baptism with the Holy Spirit the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible just in the New Testament talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's all over the place. In fact, you see the Holy, you see the Holy Spirit all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And, it's amazing, and it goes all the way into the book of Revelation. So the Holy Spirit is, is meandering and walking through all the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he's a beautiful person. And today we want to talk about what does it mean to be filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the the promise of the Holy Spirit, the pattern, and I'm I'm going to be using a lot of Ps. So I hope that helps and helps in your memory of when you're, when you're going through this lesson, uh, you'll be, be able to remember some of those, those particular pieces. But the first P that we see, and I want to talk about, is the pattern that we typically see in the New Testament. For the pattern for what? Or for who? A believer. The pattern that we see in the New Testament from people coming to Christ is there's salvation, and then there's water baptism, and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are kind of the the three the three phases of the journey of a Christian that we see in the New Testament. Now it's not a it's not a formula, okay? Because we know the thief on the cross. Uh, he was just saved uh, when Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. So he didn't have a chance to get water baptized. He didn't have a chance to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So we're not talking about a prerequisite to get into heaven, but it is, it is a powerful dynamic being, being water baptized. And hopefully uh, m- most of you have been water baptized and, and hopefully most of you are believers. And if not, that's okay. Listen to the lesson and, and maybe that'll inspire you to uh, follow Christ today. But the typical pattern that we see in, in the New Testament is someone receives Christ as their Savior, then the next thing is to be water baptized. And then we see, even in, in, uh, in the book of Acts and in, and in the book of Ephesians, we see that, that people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul went into Ephesus and he, he saw a group of people there and he says, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we never even heard of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you're here then because you have come to the right place because today I'm going to do the best I can to teach you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the power of God? And so we see the pattern of people receive of salvation, water baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And also we see the next, here's your next P, that we see the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ himself promised us the Holy Spirit. He said, it's expedient. It's very important. I must go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. And don't be worried. Don't be worried. I'm not going to leave you as little children without parents, as orphans. But the Holy Spirit's going to come when I ascend into heaven, and he's going to be your comforter. And he's going to be one just like me, called along the side, to, along your side to walk with you, the parakletos in the, great, in the Greek. One just like me, called alongside of you to help you, the parakletos. And so we see that Jesus Christ, he said, don't worry, I'm going to send the promise. And that's the actual word that he used. He used the word promise. And we see that in, in Luke uh, chapter 24, and in the last verse, he talks, don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. I don't know about you, but I want the power of God in my life. And I know over the last seven sessions in Freedom Weekend uh, that you've gone through a lot, of, lot of, a lot of things in your life and you've let go of some things. You're sweeping the house clean, if you will. Your spiritual house is becoming clean. And so what I want to do is I want to teach you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the promise. I'm going to show you all these wonderful things so you can be filled. So once the house is clean, we want to make sure we fill it up. Once your spiritual house is clean, we want to make sure that you're filled with something, that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is so cool because we see in the book of Ephesians, 
It says here in, in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 17, and I love how this is set up by the Apostle Paul. Again, Apostle Paul went into Ephesus, and he was the one to ask these, these, these new converts, have you ever heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? He goes, we never heard of that. And so he says this in Ephesians chapter 5, wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So he's saying, don't be unwise, and it's important for us to understand what the will of the Lord is. And he goes from there right into the next verse. And it's just interesting how this verse precedes the next verse when it's talking about being filled with the Spirit. And one of the, one of the things he says, he says, and don't get drunk with, with wine, and which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So if you want to be, so what Paul's saying here, it's not a direct correlation, but you can kind of read into it a little bit because he puts it right in here, but among a lot of other things. He says, if you want to be wise and understand what the will of the Lord is, and I know all of us want to be wise in the Lord, and we want to all want to know what the will of the Lord is. That's one of the big questions of Christians. You know, I just want to know what the will of the Lord is for my life. Well, one of the ways that, that helps you understand to have wisdom and understand what the will of the Lord is, is to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And he says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is in excess. In other words, don't go after the world and participate in all the things of the world. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. I, I, I hear, and I read things, and I, and I hear things a lot. There's so many people out in the world, they're, 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 they're looking for anything and everything that will fill the spiritual void that they have in their life. They do all kinds of crazy things out there to try to fill the spiritual void in their life. And the first thing is to receive Christ as their Savior. But people do all kinds of crazy things. I had a friend of mine, he, was, he, says, he was telling me, he goes, man, I went to this place the other day, and I had a sound bath. And I said, a what? A sound bath. And when he puts this bowl on you and they, they do all this kind of stuff and it makes vibrations and it makes these tones. And he goes, and, 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 I, th and I said, that sounds cool, but you're probably looking for love in all the wrong places. I said, and there's so many people feeling like because he said it was almost like a spiritual experience. There's only one spirit and he's the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of counterfeit spirits out there trying to fill voids in your life, but nobody can do it like the Holy Spirit. And so he, Paul says, don't get drunk with the wine. In other words, don't try to do, fill, your, fill yourself up with things in the world, but be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So we see there's a pattern for us as believers where there's salvation, there's water baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see that Jesus Christ himself promise us, promises all of us as believers the Holy Spirit. So what happens? When did it happen? And so if you go to the book of Acts, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, and it moves into the book of Acts. And what is the book of Acts? The, Acts, the, the book of Acts are the Acts of the Apostles going out and doing the bidding of Christ throughout all the earth. So the disciples, the 12 disciples, became the apostles after they were endued with power from on high, and they went out. Apo in the Greek, the prefix, means they go out. So they were sent out to do amazing exploits in the earth. And so when did all that happen? So when, when, was, when, when, did, they, when did all this take place in their life? Uh, when was the inaugural event? that sent them out and do all. And so it was, the, it was the, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, and it may be on the screen, you'll probably put it on the screen, but if you go to the book of Acts, chapter one, we'll see the story of Pentecost. All right, that's the next P. So you have the pattern, the promise, and then Pentecost. And Pentecost was one of the seven Jewish feasts. There's seven Jewish feasts, if you look in the Old Testament, but Pentecost was one of those feasts. And if you go to Acts chapter one, you see also here in verse four, it says this. And so Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, he was a physician. He wrote the book of Luke and he also wrote the book of Acts. And so he continues the story from Luke. So, he's the, so he, he talked about the promise, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And then you go to Acts chapter one, verse four, and it says here, and being assembled together with them, 
commanded them that they should not. This is Jesus talking to the disciples after his resurrection. And this is, 10 day, this is 50 days after his resurrection. And he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but do what? Wait for the what? Promise. There it is, the P. The promise of the Father, which he says, you have heard from me. For, for John truly baptized you with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus Christ left, I'm sorry, I said 50. Jesus Christ ascended 40 days after his resurrection. And in the disciples, from, so after he was ascended, they waited another 10 days in a, in a place called the upper room. And so on the 50th day, which is the day of Pentecost, we pick up in Acts chapter 2. And so we're going to go there, just go right over to the next chapter. And this is where the baptism, the inaugural event, where the baptism of the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Baptized. When you get saved, Christ baptizes you into salvation. When you get water baptized, you, another person, another believer can water baptize you. But we see that Christ baptizes them in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that in Acts chapter 2. So it says here, and I'm going to read this because this is going to, it's not going to make much sense, but I'm going to try to explain this to you. So in Acts chapter 2, if you have your Bible there, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, that was one of the Jewish feasts, they were all with one accord in one place. So there were 120 people in this upper room in Jerusalem. Jesus told them, don't, go, don't leave Jerusalem until you're filled with power from one high. And so they, they found this. And a lot of people believe that upper room was the same place where they had the Last Supper, where Jesus prayed over them, washed their feet, and they had the Last Supper. And so they were up in this upper room, and they were all in one accord. That means they were all in unity together, and they were praying and they didn't quite know what to expect. They were just up there, and they were, here's the thing. They were being, they were obedient to Christ. They just did, they were just doing and being obedient to the last thing he told them to do. Don't leave from Jerusalem on high, just wait. Something's going to happen. And so here they are, they're up in this room, and it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't the wind, but it sounded like the wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. This is so powerful. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. I don't know exactly what that looks like. Nobody does. But I think, I think it's, a figuratively, it's a figurative way of saying something that it was like fire. In other words, have you ever tried to put a fire out in your backyard or you have leaves or something and you try to stomp on it and when you stomp on it, it kind of just spreads everywhere else? I think that's what it was like. I think it was like a fire that was just spreading and it, and it, and it was like on each person. It wasn't a fire. It was like a fire. In other words, they were, things were happening like it was like, wow, it was like a wildfire. It just took off. And so there was this, this sound and it was just this, 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 like a fire of, of tongues. And we're going to read that. Languages. And it was like a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared clover tongues as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. It's like each one, each person was like on fire with this. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak. And here's, and here's the phenomenon. So all of a sudden they're in this room. There's a sound, it's like a wind blowing around. And then all of a sudden they start speaking in this, these languages. It wasn't their mother tongue. There were other languages. And they, and they began to speak with these languages as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gave them others. You know, I tell people all the time, you know what the, you know what the job of the Holy Spirit is? The job of the Holy Spirit is to make a Holy Spirit. I know that sounds a little trite. But it's so true. When the Holy Spirit comes and lives, lives inside of us, He helps us. He sanctifies us. And that's a whole another topic, but it's the process of cleansing as we go along. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and unrighteousness and helps to cleanse us from all ungodliness. 
And so when we, before we come to Christ, all of us have a lot of, quote, ungodliness in our life. We're, we're driven by the flesh. But the Holy Spirit comes inside of us to make a Holy Spirit. Our spirit, before Christ came to live inside of us, was not holy. I know mine wasn't. And the Bible says, that's all of us. The Bible says in Psalm, there's none good, no, not one. And so all of us have an ungodly, unholy spirit. When Christ comes to live, he begins to change in our life. We become justified before him. That means we're legally right and declared right before Christ, before God. And then the Holy Spirit comes inside to us, and he begins to empower us. And we're going to see that. So we see that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. That word there is, this is written, the English translation was primary, came from the King James Version, 1611. So that word tongues is a little bit of a misnomer. A lot of people get hung up with that word. But in the Greek, it's glossa. And that's where we get the word glossary. So it really means languages. It's like, so all of a sudden they began to speak these languages that were not their mother tongue as the spirit. And that word right there is pneuma. So if you go to Bible college and you study about the Holy Spirit, it's called the doctrine of pneumatology. So pneuma is where we get the word. So it's, it's wind, it's air. It was the breath of God. So pneuma, that's where you might have heard of uh, pneumatic tools, compressed air, pneumatic tools. That's, that's where this word comes, that's where that word comes from, from pneuma. So as the pneuma, the breath of God came into them, that was the real wind. As the breath of God came into them, all of a sudden, their language began to change. He, God put in them a prayer language. It was a real language. And today, how does, that, how does that manifest in our life today? God may give us a, give us a language or a few syllables from a language, but, but we mainly use that in our prayer. It's our prayer language. When, when we run out of words to say in English or whatever your mother tongue is, wherever you are around the world, when, sometimes I just run out of words to say in my own mother tongue, and I just start praying in the Holy Spirit, in my prayer language. How, when God baptized me with the Holy Spirit, he, he gives every one of us a prayer language, Okay. And so, and so as the Spirit gives them utterance, so they began to pray as the Holy Spirit, the wind of God, was giving them the utterance to do it. And there, in verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem all these people. Remember, this was a feast in Jerusalem. So people came from all over the world, from all different countries and nations, and they began to hear this. And they were, they were, they were Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, so, and they were confounded. So what happened was, is that there was this big feast going on on the day of Pentecost, which was a Sunday in Jerusalem. So all these people began to stumble outside from the upper room, and they came down into the marketplace, and they were, they were, they were uttering these languages. And all these people began to hear. And then they began to mock them, say, oh, these people, they're drunk. They're just drunk. They're drunk on new wine. And then Peter all of a sudden stood up and said, these men and women are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. And he talked about that they will begin to speak with new tongues, new languages. And that was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And you could, and I, I encourage you in your, in your time over the next week or so, next day or so, read Acts chapter two and read it with fresh eyes and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So we see this was on the day of Pentecost and some interesting things happen. So Peter begins to stand up and he begins to defend what happened. What happened? He began to preach to them for like 30 some verses and he actually preached the first message in the New Testament, and he was a changed person. He was a changed person. Because before he, he, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, remember in the garden when Jesus was being crucified, the little girl said, hey, are you one? Aren't you one of his disciples? And he said, no, I'm not even a part of this man. 
And he ran out and he began to cry profusely. He was so convicted. He couldn't even stand up for Christ, for Jesus, who he'd walked with for three and a half years. In his most excruciating moment with Jesus, he couldn't stand up for him. But now Jesus is not there. He's in heaven. The Holy Spirit has now empowered Peter to speak the word. And he stood up with boldness to all these people in the marketplace in Jerusalem and he began to preach with power and conviction. And Peter, at that point, is truly a changed person. And so that's the power that happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we see that. And actually, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, Jesus is telling them. He's telling them, you're going to receive power, and he's going to give them the purpose for it. So your next P is the power. And Jesus said, but you shall receive power power. That's dunamis. There's two primary Greek words for power in the New Testament. There's dunamis, where we get the word dynamite, okay? And then there's exousia, where we get authority. But here, this is the word dynamite. In other words, you're going to be filled with power to do what? Mighty exploits for me. You see that in the Old Testament. Samson, for example, the Bible says that Samson, we know what happened with him, if, if you read the story, that, that he was deceived by a woman. Because, but, but anyway, so he, he would do amazing things. And the Bible said he would be filled with the Holy Spirit and he would do just incredible feats of strength. He ripped the, door, the doors off of a city one time and marched them 40 miles to another city. The gates of a city. Can you imagine that one man doing that? It would, it would, you would need a bulldozer to do something like that. But Samson did it. So God's going to fill you with supernatural power. Now, you may not rip the doors off the city of Gaza, but you can do some pretty amazing things. In other words, he's going to give you power for what? To be a witness. And that's what happened with, with Peter. He didn't have the power to be a witness in that, in that courtroom, in that courtyard, when that girl confronted him. He had no power. He ran out. He was powerless. But after he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there was a power that came on, on him, a conviction to follow Christ. And not only to follow him, to stand up for him and to speak up for him. And so Christ says, and you shall receive a dunamis power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then here's the, here's the next P. It's power with a purpose. It's just not power for you. It's power with a purpose. It's for the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. It says, and you shall be what? witnesses. That, that's, that's what Peter was doing. He was a witness for Christ. Amazing. Incredible. And then he went on and he did amazing. You read all through the book of Acts and all through the New Testament. He just did amazing things. He was, he was just an incredible person. And he so loved Christ. He goes, when, so when he was being martyred for Christ, he goes, I'm not even worthy to be martyred. They were going to crucify him. I'm not even worthy to be uh, martyred or crucified upright. I want you to crucify me upside down. I'm not going to do it like Christ did it. I mean, what a, wow, that, that's incredible. And so Peter stood up for Christ, and he had power upon him, and he had a new purpose in life. And the main purpose is it gives you power to be a witness for Christ. And that's how the gospel gets propagated all over the world. And you might ask, is that for me today? Pastor Randy, is that, I mean, I mean, that's the Bible. That's, that's 2,000 years ago. Is that for me today? It most certainly is. So if you go back over to Acts chapter 2, the next verse, I'm just going through the Bible here. So you go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and we see, and so I'm going to back up to verse 37, because Peter preaches this amazing message, incredible to all these people in the marketplace out there, and the 120 are standing there with him. So he's preaching to all these thousands of people. And it says, now when they heard this, heard what? The message, the powerful message by Peter, they were pricked in their heart. In other words, they were convicted. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives you the words to say with conviction that pricks the heart and brings people to a point of having to make some kind of decision. That's what preaching does. And they said unto Peter, 
and to the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, when we hear the message, we hear this, what, what, what are we supposed to do with this? He, Peter brought them to a point of decision. Then Peter said in verse 38 unto them, repent. In other words, turn from your wicked ways and be baptized, every one of you be water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin. And then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's the pattern. Remember we talked about the pattern? There's salvation, there's water baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 238, it's power packed right in there. So that's, that's, that's the pattern. So he didn't miss it. He didn't miss his opportunity. So let me tell you what you need to do. You need to get saved, you need to get water baptized, and you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you shall receive, not you might receive. He said, you shall receive, and you will receive the gift. I love that. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us today, an absolute gift. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and here it is. Pastor Rain, is this for me today? Here it is. For the promise is unto you. And to your children, listen to this. You talk about generations. It is for you, your children, and to all, I love this, that are afar off. <laughs> you know what that means? That means that's for, that's for me and you. That's for today. That's for us today. We, we are the afar off ones, if you will. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Isn't that powerful? That's for all of us today. When the, when the call of salvation goes out and someone receives Christ, that's the call. That's the afar off one. And that's the ones the Lord God calls. So those who receive Christ, we're all, we're all candidates for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every believer is a qualified candidate to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the provision. And he gives us the power. And, and the power is for us to have this beautiful prayer language. God gives us a beautiful prayer language. So what is that for us today? You know, like I said earlier, when I'm praying, sometimes I just run out of, words to say. But I love what it says, and I'm going to go to the next book over, and I'm just going through the, the Bible here. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, I love, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. Remember, he's the one that asked those believers in Ephesus, did you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit since you believed? Okay, he says here, likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps us in our infirmities, in our weaknesses, in our human frailty. We are so weak as humans. I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about just, we're just fragile human beings. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Sometimes we just don't know, we just don't know how to pray. You get into a situation I don't know how to pray. I've been in so many situations. Lord, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know how to start this. I, I, just, I have so many issues going on. And you know what I do? I just start praying in the Holy Spirit. And it takes the pressure off. It's not like I have to figure out semantically and verbally how to say a proper prayer to God. I just start praying in the Holy Spirit. The prayer language that God gave me, he began to give it to me when I was 11 years old. And he gave it, and I just started praying in that prayer language. Let me tell you something, it takes the pressure off out of prayer. Because I know, because here it says, why? But the Spirit himself, so it's not me trying to cognitively pray out of my head, okay? But the Holy Spirit inside of me begins to pray what? Through me, the pneuma, this pneuma spirit of God begins to pray through me because I baptize fully with the Holy Spirit. 
The pneuma of God prays through me and makes intercession for us. Well, here it is, with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, words I don't even understand. I don't even understand. And it doesn't make natural sense. It doesn't. If you try to figure this out of the natural mind, you're going to go tilt. That's an old pinball illustration. If you ever played a pinball machine, you're going to go tilt and it's game over. You can't, you can't do it. You can't try to make it out. That's why it's called, it's supernatural. It's above our natural senses. It's above the four dimensions that we live in. It's above that. It's, I like to say it like this, it's the fifth dimension. It's the dimension of God Almighty, who's above all the fourth dimension, length, width, height, and the time-space continuum. God is above all that. And we're tapping into the heavenlies. When we pray in the Holy Spirit, we're tapping into the heavenly dimension of God Almighty. God Almighty. And so I run out, I run out of things to pray. And it is amazing. It's amazing what happens. When I start praying, all this, and I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have an object of prayer, and I'll start off in English, and you start whatever language you are, and then I'll just start praying, that object of prayer, I'll just start praying in my heavenly language. And I'm telling you, it takes the pressure off, and God will begin to give you supernatural insights, creativity. He gives you words. He'll impress a scripture. If you're praying for a loved one, he'll, he'll impress a scripture about a situation. And I'm telling you, you just live at rest. You live at rest. I remember when I was a little kid when I was in this little denominational church and, and there was an evangelist there and he invited people to come up to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I went right up front and he laid, and there were several of us up there and he laid hands upon me and God gave me a syllable, one syllable, one syllable. It was like in the Bible, it was the cloud, as the, the, the cloud the size of a man's hand. But he gave me that one little syllable. And out of that, God began to, over, a year, over the years, God has given me a beautiful prayer language. And what does it say? I have no idea what I'm saying, but it's a prayer language. It's syllables. And so today, this is for you. This is for you today. And so I'm going to pray for you. And so I want to encourage you. So, Pastor Randy, how does it, how does it happen? How does it happen? Where well, the prayer is in Luke, the most, the, the most simple prayer, the simplest prayer that we see in Scripture that proof texts this and how to receive the Holy Spirit or gives, shows us how it's provided for us is in Luke 11. Luke 11, 11. That's how you can remember, memorize that. It's Luke 11, 11. And this is Christ himself. He's saying this to a group of people. He says, listen here. If a son, and I love this. This is, this is the provision for the Holy Spirit for you today. If a son, this is Christ himself speaking. How do I know that? It's in red in my Bible. Okay, the words are red. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father, will you give him a stone? Of course not. That's ludicrous. That's ridiculous. If your son asks you for a piece of bread, you will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we instead of a fish, we give him a serpent? He, he's, Christ is trying to make a point here, and he's, he's being a little ludicrous about it just so he can, make, he can further press the point of how much he wants the Holy Spirit for you. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? No, of course not. 
If you then, being evil, in other words, you live in a corrupt body that's dying, okay, being corrupt, you're not, in, you're not angels, <laughs> okay? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, all of us that are parents, we understand that concept. We want to give good gifts to our children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give what? Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit. So, it's a, so this is what I say. How did you receive salvation? You ask for it. You put your faith in Christ. You ask Christ to come into your life. You repented of your sin. You asked for forgiveness. You turned from your wicked ways. And you said, Christ, I'm tired of living on my own. I need you to live in my life. The same way that we ask for the Holy Spirit, you just ask him for the Holy Spirit and he will give it to you. He'll give it to you. And he'll give you a language. And how does that work? So if you're sitting there, you're saying, Pastor Randy, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, this is what I would say. Take Luke 11 and you read that and just lift up your hands. Say, God, I'm saved. I ask you to fill me afresh today. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want to see the I want to receive the gift of a heavenly language. And you just begin worshiping the Lord in the best way you know how. Just begin to, to worship God. And you know what will happen? God will begin to impress upon you a syllable, some sound, a syllable. Uh, or it could be like the Niagara Falls, boom, God will give you a gusher, as we say. And it just, it just kind of blurts. That's what happened to my wife. My wife was in college in her junior year, sophomore, junior year, and her friend kept telling her, you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She goes, that's the craziest thing. I don't want any part of that. And one night she was in her bed in her dorm room. She opened up her Bible, started reading Acts chapter 2, and she said, Lord, if this is real, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And she said it was like a gusher just came out. She, she was so surprised. It just happened. But she positioned herself in a place to receive, just like I positioned myself when I was a kid to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's not a one-time thing. Because in Ephesians 5 says, to be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. You read all through the book of Acts. The apostles, they, all, they, they were filled afresh, the Bible says. Whenever a situation presented itself, they were filled afresh in the Holy Spirit. And why is that important? Because we leak. So back to my point. So lift up your hands. Ask the Holy Spirit to come inside of you. Ask him to fill you, to baptize you, to immerse you in his Holy Spirit. And you'll begin to sense. You may not hear a rushing mighty wind. It may not be like tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2. But you'll begin to sense a syllable or two. And as God gives that to you, remember, you've asked, asked Christ to come into you. You've asked the Holy Spirit to come and he's not going to go, nah, no, I'm not going to do it today. Wait till tomorrow. He's not going to do that. That's crazy. Was your salvation delayed after you asked him? No. Immediately you were saved if you were genuine. Immediately God's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit if you're genuine and you ask. And God, and you ask for a heavenly language, God's going to give you a syllable or two. And this is what I say. Let it out. Just let it come forth. Because it's the pneuma of God, right? He's living inside of you, and it's an utterance. As the Spirit, Acts chapter 2, gave them utterance. He's going to give you the utterance, but you have to cooperate, okay? So as you get this impression, let it come forth, and you see what happens. And God's going to be, give you a beautiful, beautiful prayer language. It's to help build you up but really, the Holy Spirit does that to build you up and to help you to be a witness to other people. It's about building you up 
to help you be a witness to other people. And one last verse, I want to show you this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. And, uh, and Acts, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is one of the best treaties in the Bible on the purpose and how to properly use the baptism of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says this, Apostle, Saint, Apostle Paul says this, verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, okay? For if I pray in an unknown tongue or an unknown language, that's what we're talking about here, it's your prayer language, my spirit prays, that's your spirit, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, I don't understand what I'm saying, but I know God's speaking through me, like in Romans 8, 8, 26, with groanings that cannot be uttered. But what is it then? So he explains, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. So I'm going to go back and forth in my prayer time in understanding and praying in the Spirit. I will, you can also sing. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So God gives us the Holy Spirit to edify and to build us up. In Jude 20, another, another chapter, another book in the Bible later on, you can read it before the book of Revelation. Jude 20, it's only one chapter. It says this, Jude says this, build yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. So as we as Christians, we get weak as we walk along in life and what on a daily day basis, every day I ask God, fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. And I begin to pray in the Holy Spirit because I need to build my faith up. Whenever you feel like you're getting weak in your faith, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. So that's for you today, my friends. And so I want to pray a prayer for you. So if you're sitting there and going, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what do I do? So, number one, just lift up your hands, read Luke 11, 11, read that passage, three scriptures. Lift up your hands, get in a posture of receiving. Like, you, you have your hands out when you receive a gift. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lift up your hands to the Lord and just begin to worship the Lord and just, say, just tell the Holy Spirit, and tell God, I want to receive the Holy Spirit, baptize me with the Holy Spirit, and God will give you an impression of some syllables, and you speak them. And that's just the beginning. And so I want to pray a prayer for you. And uh, yes, this may be uh, in your, your notes. Uh, but I want to pray, okay? So just lift up your hands where you are, and you can just, just repeat this prayer after me. And uh, I think you've already done some renouncement prayers. But uh, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I am a believer. I am your child, and you are my Father. Jesus is my Lord. Lord, I believe with all my heart that your word is true. Your word says, if I shall ask, I shall receive the Holy Spirit. So in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to fill me to overflowing with your precious Holy Spirit. Jesus, Baptize me today in the Holy Spirit because of your word I now receive and I thank you for it. I believe the Holy Spirit is in me and by faith I accept it. Holy Spirit, rise up within me as I praise you. I fully expect to walk in the power as you give me your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.